thank you all for being here, and uh, thank you, Chris, for the, the really nice introduction. Um, I think, uh, just to start off, th th this lecture series by principles, I think, is a great endeavor. Uh, I think it's a way in which our college can fulfill its vocation and uh, actually play a great role uh, in our country and society at large and in the church today. So I'll, I'll try to offer you uh, a little tidbit today, meditating on uh, some ironies associated with the notion of, of the Crusades being a, a politically operative concept in the modern world. Yes, the, the notion that the medieval Crusades are somehow a politically operative thing, a politically weaponized, if you'll forgive me, a politically weaponized concept. You know, we, we have to ask, how is it that medieval events can, be some, can become so politicized in modern times? Uh, you know, my mentor Thomas Madden uh, always relates the story of how when the 9-11 attacks occurred, um, he was the only professional historian of the Crusades who worked in the United States. And uh, so his phone rang off the hook. Journalists from the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, CNN, uh, they wanted him to talk about, okay, how did the Crusades lead to this? How, how, how did the Crusades lead to 9-11? Uh, and they were never satisfied with his answer because his answer was that they don't at all. Uh, and then when he was, well, what did the Crusades have to do with 9-11? And he said, nothing. Can I get off the phone? And uh, this, this used to drive journalists crazy. Uh, because in point of fact, it's obvious, the Crusades of the Middle Ages have always fascinated the modern mind, right? Uh, in fact, each successive age of modernity has interpreted the Crusades through the often distorting lens of contemporary experience, right? Uh, you have all of these events that create modernity, right? And, and all of them affect the way that people have thought about the Crusades of the Middle Ages. Uh, the shattering of Europe's religious consensus during the Protestant Reformation. Uh, you have the secularization of statecraft and intellectual culture during the Enlightenment. Uh, the 19th century scramble for colonial empire, and of course the horrific, ideologically driven wars of the 20th century, all of them left their stamp on historians' conception of the medieval crusades. Uh, you also have powerful cultural movements, political movements, uh, like 19th century nationalism, romanticism. All of these things contribute heavily to the evolution of attitudes towards the crusades in modernity, as the Crusades are continually rediscovered in each successive generation. Uh, finally, in the 20th century, you have, in the 1950s, Stephen Runciman's magnificently written three-volume history of the Crusades. And uh, this, it encapsulates and it perpetuated a broad set of verdicts about the Crusades that drew heavily from that whole catalog of, of historical influences from the Reformation to the 20th century. Uh, in fact, most historians would actually agree with Thomas Madden's famous saying that that Runciman, through his powerful synthesis of the various strands of intellectual modernity, he, and I'll, I'll quote Matt and quote, single-handedly crafted the modern popular vision of the Crusades. All right. So there's a popular vision of the Crusades that is distinct in the modern world that can be invoked politically by politicians in the U.S. or, or elsewhere, right? Uh, and this is a vision that is fundamentally crafted by Stephen Runciman, right? So uh, how does Runciman draw from these various threads of intellectual modernity, right? Well, just like Reformation era propagandists, Runciman, he, he wants to see crusading as this tool of a corrupt papacy, a far too powerful papacy, which sent men off to die on foolish and doomed campaigns, thousands of miles from hearth and home. From Voltaire, Gibbon, Schiller, other luminaries of the Enlightenment, Runciman inherited a, a sharp disdain for the religious fervor of medieval men and women. All right? We all know the Enlightenment verdict on the religiosity of the Middle Ages. Uh, this is a powerful influence on figures like Runciman. Not surprisingly, of course, Runciman's gonna present the Crusades as among the more freakish and bizarre byproducts of medieval piety. Uh, then, of course, from the experience of the 19th century, Runciman had inherited the idea uh, that the Crusades were Europe's first colonial venture. And this makes sense. Uh, for many intellectuals, if you lived through Europe's scramble for colonial empire in the 19th century, if, if you lived through the scramble for Africa, uh, you would easily you know, kind of look at the Crusades through that lens and say, oh, okay, this is where we started doing this, right? Uh, but of course, for most intellectuals, the discrediting of colonialism in the 20th century actually deepens your mental association between crusading and colonialism rather than the contrary. And this is certainly true for Runciman. And then, of course, the experience of the Second World War is not far to seek in Runciman. Uh, Runciman has this utter, utter horror at the lengths to which men can be driven by blind adherence to ideology. And in this vein, he sees the Crusades as a powerful cautionary tale for the modern age. So it would actually be difficult to exaggerate the influence uh, of Runciman's synthesis 
over the popular mind in the 20th century. Of course, it's filtered through textbooks, through the media, through cinema, through fiction. Uh, if, if you look at anything about the Crusades in Time Magazine, in The New Yorker, uh, in virtually any movie that comes out of Hollywood, even in casual references to these phenomena uh, from our politicians who uh, often are, are they're fond of acting like they're profoundly familiar with historical events that happened eight or 900 years ago. Um, but it, it's not surprising, right? Because when the educated classes in our society make any reference to the Crusades at all, they're almost always, even if unconsciously, invoking and passing sentence on some watered-down version of Stephen Runciman that they have in their minds from their education, usually from their college education. They don't have to know anything about the historical events themselves to make confident reference to the Crusades, right? Uh, so, I mean, we retreated to the most recent example in 2015. Uh, our president, President Obama, he makes the seemingly offhand kind of one-line reference to the Crusades uh, in the National Prayer Breakfast in 2015. And he just casually kind of catalogs them alongside other horrible things, right? The Crusades, you can catalog uh, them, you know, just alongside these other horrors, right? The atrocities perpetrated by ISIS, right? Um, he cites recent sectarian massacres in, in various African and Asian conflicts, uh, abuses in the Indian caste system, slavery, Jim Crow, and of course, no list would be complete without the Inquisition, right? So, uh, for Obama, he, he's, he's totally comfortable doing this, as most educated people in the West would be. Uh, most people who have been the beneficiaries of university education since the Second World War, they've been taught to think of the Crusades in these types of terms, right? And doing so actually comports with a kind of a broad vision of human progress, I think, which is shared universally among elites in the modern West. Uh, and it gives rise to this fascinating imperviousness to correction. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting uh, when you see, for example, uh, one uh, book review uh, lady in The New Yorker uh, who, who you know, kind of reviews scholarly books in, uh, in, in this somewhat pretentious way, right? She's reviewing scholarly books for a popular audience that will never read scholarly books. Um, but she got very, very uncomfortable uh, when two great English scholars, um, uh, Thomas Asperidge and Christopher Tyerman came out with new books on the Crusades about 10 years ago. And uh, she couldn't make heads or tails of them in the review. And she finally ends up telling the audience, I, I think it seems like these guys think the Crusades were okay. Um, now, of course, she's reviewing scholarly monographs by professional historians neither of whom, to my knowledge, is any kind of a practicing Christian, right? Uh, so she's reviewing the scholarly work of, of scholars who are motivated simply by professionalism and is disturbed not to find the take on the Crusades there that she's expecting to find, right? Uh, and this is because elites in the modern West have this kind of uh, almost infuriating imperviousness to correction, right? They want to be able to lump the Crusades in with the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide, and uh, the Belgian Congo. And the details really don't matter, right? For most educated people, the Crusades are an idea. They're a concept, a trope, rather than some incredibly complex set of historical phenomena that might take some effort to understand, right? And to make matters worse, of course, popular cinematic and documentary presentations on the Crusades, uh, like that, that horrific Ridley Scott movie that I always tell everyone not to watch, uh, you know, what do they do? They simply draw from the same old wells, right? Ignoring the insights of more recent academic scholarship, which has meticulously discredited Runciman and his synthesis, um, because that would complicate the editorial message in some rather embarrassing ways. Um, now, on the other hand, you do find some Catholic apologists, right? Catholic apologists, on the other hand, they've seen fit to make at least selective use of recent trends in historical scholarship on the Crusades. It is selective, unfortunately. Um, but in particular, uh, decades of scholarly work by great figures like the, the recently deceased Jonathan Riley Smith of Cambridge, uh, as well as my own mentor Thomas Madden at St. Louis University, they've provided much that Catholic apologists and popularizers of medieval history have found appetizing and worthy of repetition. Uh, for example, Jonathan Riley Smith, uh, God rest his soul, he just died a week or so ago, his obituary, um, one of my colleagues forwarded to me, great obituary in the Telegraph, uh, great man, Riley Smith, he, um, he completely overturned the scholarly consensus on the motivations behind the First Crusade, right? For decades, history books, in the broadest possible sense of that term, uh, had painted a picture of the First Crusade as a misguided, brutal colonial venture in which the church 
persuaded or deluded the landless, spare sons of warrior families to redirect their violent energies against a distant, peaceful, inoffensive, and far more sophisticated civilization in the Muslim Near East. Right? This was the narrative. The notion was that there was some kind of Malthusian deadlock, there was land hunger, and then on top of the Malthusian deadlock, you had the rise of primogeniture, which means that second and third sons aren't going to inherit any land, and uh, the Crusades were a creative solution to this whole complex uh, set of problems, right? Too much violence in society, too many private wars, too many castle sieges, the church is squeamish about violence, and so the idea was send them to go fight those other people over there who are just minding their own business. Right? Uh, and this is what the First Crusade, in fact, was. Jonathan Riley Smith, on the other hand, right, completely undermines that picture. He demonstrated through sophisticated database analysis at the dawn of the computer age uh, that overwhelmingly the warrior elites uh, responsible for the First Crusade were not spare second sons at all. Riley Smith's work is called prosopography, right? identifying individuals, creating a database of individuals that can be analyzed. So Riley Smith demonstrates overwhelmingly the first crusaders, that is the men who make the expedition happen, were the lords of estates. They were men of substance who impoverished themselves to fund the expedition. All right? And with very few exceptions, they planned to return home after their armed pilgrimage to Jerusalem. All right, so Riley Smith decisively eliminates colonial exploitation or land hunger as paradigms for understanding the motivations of the Crusaders. Right? And Riley Smith instead placed penance, charity, and the redemption of their souls at the center of what motivated so many noblemen and warriors to set out for Jerusalem in response to Pope Urban II's call. So Riley Smith's arguments on this front, they're functionally irrefutable, right? uh, and they were compelling enough to win wide acceptance throughout the world of crusade scholarship and to place religion and genuine religious motivation solidly back on the radar screen of medieval historians, if you will. You know, for many decades, both positivism on the one hand and neo-Marxism on the other hand had discouraged historians from ever treating religious motives as, as operative causes in history. And in this way, Riley Smith's work, it not only overturned the way that people envisioned the Crusades and the motivation behind the Crusades, it actually overturned medieval studies in a much deeper way, in a more profound way. All of the scholars that Riley Smith trained and all the scholars influenced by him uh, came in all the various uh, areas of medieval studies came to see religion as something that actually influences history, right? Uh, and this is, of course, extremely important as scholarship swings away from neo-Marxism in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so despite Art Riley Smith almost completely winning over the professional scholars in his field, though, uh, indeed, by now, almost all the top professionals in crusade studies have been trained by Riley Smith, right? And uh, some of them are even nearing retirement. That's how long Riley Smith's career lasted. Um, but despite the interest that Riley Smith has drawn occasionally from some Catholic apologists who want to, to cherry pick from him, uh, it remains the case that the media and many editors of otherwise fine history textbooks have either just remained unaware of his work or chosen deliberately to ignore it. Uh, the History Channel, a and &E, and The New Yorker, they're not going to allow facts uh, or even a firmly established scholarly consensus to get in the way of what we described, the Crusades, as an idea, a symbol of bigotry, persecution, and the excesses of a past that we never want to return to again, a past that we as, as a society uh, can condemn. So there, one aspect of Riley Smith's highly impressive revisionist work that has received even less attention outside the ivory towers of academia is the way in which he has argued with overwhelming success, I think, for a change in scholars' working definition of the word crusade. And this is what's interesting about Riley Smith. Everyone kind of picks up on his change in the notion of, of the Crusaders' motives and what the motives were. What a lot of people miss, outside of academia, strictly speaking, is that Riley Smith actually campaigned successfully for a radical revision of our definition of the term crusade. This is an interesting thing. Most people don't realize that crusade is a modern word. Crusade is not a medieval word at all. Uh, for generations, scholars operated with what Riley Smith calls the traditional definition of crusade. They considered as true crusades only those military campaigns directed at the conquest or defense of Jerusalem and the Levant, right? So think about it. The first crusade from 1095 to 1099, 
had as its object the conquest of Jerusalem. Uh, the Second Crusade in the late 1140s, it has as its object the defense of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. The Third Crusade, towards the end of the 12th century, is led by Richard the Lionheart and Philip Augustus, has as its object the restoration of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, and so those Crusades got numbers in the early modern period, and they got counted as Crusades because their object geographically was in the Levant. It's all about geographical theater for the traditional definition of crusade. Uh, ultimately, working with this definition, of course, it becomes impossible not to pass a verdict of failure upon the whole enterprise. Obviously, every scholar and every student of history has to note that the Crusades ultimately failed to create a permanent uh, Christian kingdom in the Levant. Of course, you could even kind of quibble with that if you really want to get quibbly, right? Uh, because, of course, the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem lasted for 192 years, uh, which is longer than many modern states uh, have lasted. Uh, but be that as it may, you, you ultimately have to pass a verdict of failure on the enterprise if you accept as your definition, your working definition of crusade, the idea that crusades have to do only with Jerusalem and the Levant, right? Riley Smith came up with a different argument which won wide acceptance throughout academia, he argued that although crusading is born with Jerusalem as its goal, it actually grew through the 12th and 13th centuries into a canonical institution, right? A canonical institution that operated in many geographical theaters simultaneously as the papacy authorized crusades against various figures, pagans in the Baltic, heretical Christian lords in the south of France, political enemies of the papacy in Italy, and of course the dangerous Almohads who ruled North Africa and Spain. Later on, of course, crusades were explicitly proclaimed by the papacy in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries as Europe was directly threatened by the Ottoman Turks. So for Riley Smith, the, the distinctive features that separate crusading from other kinds of war are, number one, papal authorization or summons, number two, a vow taken by the participants, and these vows often bound uh, the participants in a crusade to celibacy or other forms of penance while on campaign. And number three, a plenary indulgence for participants as the ultimate award, uh, which was, it was usually the primary recruiting incentive, right? And of course, as crusading matured, the indulgence was accompanied by other spiritual and material benefits, the canonical protection of the crusader's property in his absence, etc. So working with this understanding of what crusade is, which emphasizes canonical features over geographical ones, the ultimate historical evaluation of the Crusades and their legacy changes dramatically. In fact, it becomes possible to argue that crusading was responsible in certain very direct ways, not only for the survival of Christian civilization through the early modern period, but also for the rise of the modern world. For example, it was only with the introduction of crusade indulgences in the 12th and 13th centuries that there appeared even a modicum of cooperation and cohesion among the Christian kingdoms of the Iberian Peninsula. Most people don't realize this. Um, the, the Spanish nationalist narrative is that there was a long 700 plus year struggle for independence from Islamic rule or something like that. Um, but of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, for the majority of the medieval period, actually, you know, prior to the 12th and 13th centuries, uh, it was much more common to find situations where you had Christian kings allied with Islamic kings fighting against other Christian kings, right? I mean, th this was far more commonly the situation in medieval Spain until you get crusade indulgences introduced. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. The very same kingdoms that had fought one another relentlessly in the 11th century, often allied with Islamic princes against their Christian brethren, they found themselves united by Pope Innocent III's call for crusade against the Almohads in 1212. The Almohads, the Almuwahidun, they were a formidable opponent. They had already crushed the North African empire of their Islamic enemies, the Almoravids, the Almurabitun. Uh, they had sacked Marrakesh in North Africa in 1147. So the Almohads are serious. They had moved on to Spain, gobbling up what was left of the Almoravid possessions there and threatening to overrun the Christian kingdoms of Portugal, Castile, and Aragon on a kind of a piecemeal basis. In 1195, they shattered a Castilian army at Alarcos, and they seized several important cities. And um, even after 1211, when the self-proclaimed successor of the prophet, al Nasr brought massive Almohad forces in from North Africa to strike a death blow at Christian Spain, it still took the proclamation of a crusade indulgence to incentivize cooperation among the various Christian kings. And the indulgence also brought recruits flowing in 
from other parts of Europe. So the result was a crushing victory for the Christian forces in 1212 at this famous battle of Las Navas de Tolosa. And on that day, the whole tide of the Reconquista turned permanently in favor of the Christian kingdoms, and especially Castile, which began to expand southwards in determined fashion. Córdoba, Jaén, Sevilla, and Cadiz, they all fell like dominoes as the 13th century ran its course. The Almohad Empire collapsed in 1252, and all that remained of Islamic Spain was the tiny rump state known to history as the Emirate of Granada, which was perennially weak, politically dysfunctional, and tributary to Castile. Thus, it's no exaggeration to say that crusading played a, a crucial role, an essential role, in creating the muscular late medieval kingdom that we call Castile, as well as its cousins, Portugal and Aragon, which enjoyed similar prosperity in the wake of Las Navas de Tolosa. So were it not for the outcome of the Iberian Crusade of 1212, the history of the great age of discovery, when Spain and Portugal led the way in opening up sea routes to the New World and the Far East, would have been radically different. All of this becomes part of the history of crusading, only in light of Riley Smith's renewed attention to crusading's distinctive canonical characteristics. Right? Moreover, it's not simply the case that crusading provided for the survival of the Christian kingdoms of Iberia in the face of powerful Islamic adversaries. The Spanish and Portuguese monarchs who fostered and funded the great 15th century expeditions of discovery across the Atlantic and around the African continent, they were motivated explicitly by the desire to find allies and sources of funding that would make the recovery of Jerusalem possible. All right, Ferdinand and Isabel were all too familiar with the medieval legend of Prester John. Who's Prester John? Mythical king of the East, descended from the ancient Magi, who ruled a prosperous Christian empire from a gilded palace. Christian kings in, in the Middle Ages and the early modern period always tried to open up correspondence with Prester John. The idea that there was this powerful potentate in the East who was descended from the Magi, who was somebody that you could turn for help against the Muslims, this was something that fired the imaginations of medieval kings. Louis IX uh, actually corresponded with um, various rulers of the Mongols because he thought that they were Prester John, and uh, he was quickly disabused because uh, they weren't. But, uh, you know, but you're still kind of looking for Prester John. Um, so for Ferdinand and Isabel, that's precisely what they're looking for. Uh, the possibility of discovering Prester John's realm, or at the very least, finding out if there was an untapped source of wealth and manpower in the so-called Indies. Uh, it was incredibly alluring for monarchs who had never ceased to dream of imitating the legendary exploits of the first crusaders, right? In some sense, their dream was realized, albeit in a form that neither they nor their medieval predecessors ever could have imagined. The opening up of new worlds to European hegemony, the expansion of European power on a global scale, and ultimately the creation of the modern world, the opportunities for great experiments with liberty and democracy, uh, and the fact that it seemed by the 19th century that no outside force could threaten Europe or the Christian West ever again. You see, crusading plays a key role in making this outcome possible. Ironically, however, by modern times, the Crusades were being dissected. They were being dissected in light of the preoccupations and experiences of modern people, who of course lived in secure, wealthy, powerful states, very unlike the medieval political conditions of the Crusaders. Right? So often it's alleged that the Crusades continue to have a, poli a positively deleterious effect on the modern world. Often it's asserted that they're remembered with opprobrium in the Islamic Middle East. So, of course, the, the most famous assertion to this effect was former President Clinton uh, in November 2001 at Georgetown. So, President Clinton, he had just he relinquished the presidency in January of 2001. 9-11 attacks happened in the first year of his successor, President Bush's presidency. President Clinton goes to Georgetown in November, November 9th, 2001, and he argues that, uh, in effect, the Crusades are the root cause of 9-11. Right. Um, he, he kind of misquoted uh, and, and drew in a specious and, and convenient way from various medieval chronicles, and he painted a picture of medieval crusaders walking through knee-deep rivers of blood uh, up to the Temple Mount and slaughtering every Muslim and Jew that they could find. Uh, and he argued that this is, of course, this atrocity, this alleged atrocity, uh, is of course remembered with opprobrium in the Islamic Middle East. There's a couple problems with this. Um, number one. What President Clinton is doing there is he's kind of leapfrogging the intervening millennium, right, to find a historical cause for a modern event far, far back in the past. 
which that should always set your antennae up a little bit on edge, right? Um, but the, the other problem with what he's doing there is that uh, President Clinton, uh, maybe what he didn't realize, is that the so-called memory of crusader atrocities uh, in the Islamic world today is not of Middle Eastern origin at all. It's a product of the modern secular education that Western colonial powers and modernizing local rulers put in place in the Middle East in the 19th and 20th centuries, right? Western education, in fact, in the 19th and 20th centuries, brought the Crusades back to life in a region where they had been forgotten for centuries. Most people don't realize there was no word for Crusade in the Arabic language until 1899. Why? Because Walter Scott had to be translated and uh, you have to make up words for things, right? Um, so in, in point of fact, this is, this is what I find fascinating. You guys know the great figure of Saladin, right? Great military leader Saladin, who united Syria with Egypt and deposed the last Fatimid Caliph and then waged war against the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. Saladin wins a smashing victory at the horns of Hattin, captures Jerusalem from the Christians. That memory of Saladin had been completely lost in the Middle East. Nobody in the 19th century Middle East knew who Saladin was, right? And we know this because Kaiser Wilhelm comes to Damascus in the early 1870s, this is 1871 or so, and uh, he's, uh, he's looking around, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't 1871, wrong year. It, it would have been later than that in the 19th century. But uh, he, he comes to Damascus and he's looking for the tomb of Saladin and he's asking around and nobody knows where the tomb of Saladin is and nobody knows who he's talking about. So he brought uh, German archaeologists and scholars to Damascus and told them to go looking for the tomb of Saladin, and eventually they found it. It was dilapidated, it was forgotten. So Kaiser Wilhelm rebuilds it, and then he, he, he laid a wreath at the tomb of Saladin that said, from one great emperor to another, right? So here's the problem, right? You have in Saladin a forgotten figure. There, there's no indigenous memory of Saladin. What there is is 19th century romantics bringing Saladin back to life in the Middle East and presenting a vision of the Crusades and of the whole era that is formed by the Enlightenment and Romanticism and Nationalism and every kind of sedimentary layer of ideology that had been built up through the European experiences of the 18th and 19th centuries. So similarly, whenever our man Osama bin Laden mentions the, the Crusades in his propaganda videos, Rather than voicing some old Middle Eastern memory of the Crusades, there really is no such thing, he's actually leaking evidence of the Western education he received with the children of other Saudi elites when he attended the Al-Fabr model school in Jeddah when he was a kid, which had a secular curriculum. So anyone familiar with Runciman can kind of detect the, the echoes of Runciman there. Now the challenge for scholars of the Crusades today, therefore, is not simply one of continuing to work on research and professional publication, but also of somehow bringing the fruits of that research to the world and challenging a view of Western history that is quite ironically shared alike by radical Islamic sheiks and readers of The New Yorker. Uh, so there we are, thanks. I'll take questions, thanks. Right, okay, so for the sake of the recording, I'll, give, I'll kind of repeat the question. Uh, so Ryan's question is, what about that account of the Crusader sack of Jerusalem in 1099, and, and what was that really like? Uh, well, in point of fact, the notion of blood running through the streets uh, comes to us from medieval accounts that were not written by eyewitnesses. It actually comes to us from medieval accounts that were written uh, in later years. And uh, there's a genre of deliberate exaggeration of the, you know, the kind of drama of warfare. And it, it's a genre that medieval people understood. So medieval people knew that there were no ankle deep rivers of blood running through the streets. Bill, I think when Bill Clinton went to Georgetown, he changed it to knee deep rivers of blood running through the streets, which now someone did a calculation on that, the amount of people that you would have to squeeze dry to get knee deep rivers of blood in Jerusalem. And um, no. Uh, <laughs> There's no knee-deep rivers of blood. There's no ankle-deep rivers of blood either. Uh, no, in point of fact, what, what actually happens at the sack of Jerusalem in 1099 uh, is you have, you have initial violence when the Crusaders capture the city, which is standard uh, you know, in, in the kind of conventions of medieval warfare. Uh, if you look at Muslims, Christians, Byzantines, uh, whenever anyone sacks a city, uh, it, it's messy at the outset. But what you do not have is a systematic butchery of the population of the city. 
Uh, thousands and thousands of people in the city uh, departed the city after the Crusaders captured it. Uh, the richer residents were you know, probably shaken down for some ransom, and um, the majority of them were simply let go. Uh, so that's, it's incompatible with the idea of systematic butchery of the population there. Good question. <laughs> that's actually a really good question. Are the Crusades used to any political effect in countries that are majority Eastern Orthodox? Uh, yes, unfortunately they are. Um, the media was really confused in 2001 when Pope John Paul II got off the plane in Greece and uh, there were Greek Orthodox monks there holding signs that said the Pope is the Antichrist. And uh, my favorite one was Papa Persona Non Grata. Um, and uh, this of course is based on um, a modern Greek notion of grievance associated with the Fourth Crusade. Now, uh, this is a similarly interesting thing because the modern Greek memory of the Fourth Crusade is similarly young. It, it, it's just like the alleged Middle Eastern memory of the Crusades in general. Uh, the modern Greek memory of the Fourth Crusade, I've never been able to trace it back past the 19th century. Uh, you know, I, I did a study in grad school of uh, all uh, Byzantine historical chronicles uh, from the 13th century up through the 16th and uh, never found any mention whatsoever of grievance associated with the Latin sack of Constantinople in 1204. Uh, so if, if they were upset about it, they certainly didn't say so. Um, you know, the, the modern Greek notion is that it's actually the Fourth Crusade which destroys the political viability of the Byzantine Empire. And, uh, and so that there's a couple of planks there of, of the vision. And this is a 19th century nationalist vision, that it was the Fourth Crusade which destroys the political viability of the Byzantine Empire, and that the Pope sent it, right? Now, both of those things have been thoroughly, thoroughly um, dismantled by historians, right? Um, modern historians of Byzantium and of the Crusades, although they see the Fourth Crusade as kind of a horrible thing and, and a horrible tragedy, uh, they tend to see it actually in part more as a symptom of existing Byzantine political dysfunction and as a side effect of Byzantine political dysfunction uh, rather than as something that caused the weakening of the Byzantine Empire or made them vulnerable to Turkish conquest or something like that. Uh, and of course, it's, it's abundantly clear that nobody in the West foresaw the diversion of the Fourth Crusade to Constantinople. Uh, that's a product of very complicated historical circumstances and, and a chain of events. But of course, the details don't really matter, right? When you're building a nationalist vision in the 19th century, the details just get in the way. So um, Dr. Gutterbach's question is in regard to contemporary antipathy, antipathy towards the West in the Islamic world, to what extent is this caused by kind of deeper historical causes and to what extent is this caused by more contemporary things? Is that the question? Um, my argument is that it's, it all has to do with contemporary things. Always these things have to do with, with contemporary things. And um, I think I, I would be careful about nuancing the premise of the question uh, in that a lot of times when people say modern Islamic antipathy towards the West, not, not you, but, but other people, oftentimes there's a kind of loaded set of premises there, the, the whole us and them and why do they hate us thing. And I, I, I would want to nuance that a little bit. But insofar as there is antipathy towards the West uh, in the modern Islamic world, um, I think the roots of it come in that this era when you have the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, there's a collapse in the religious consensus in the Middle East, particularly a collapse in the jurisprudential consensus uh, in the Islamic world. And so that, coupled with the kind of fierce anti-colonialism of that era, gives rise to a modern antipathy to the West that is clothed in Islamic garb if you will. Uh, in other words, simultaneously with the collapse of the Ottoman jurisprudential system, uh, you have to have the rise of, of new attempts to recreate true Islamic law in the Middle East and societies governed by Islamic law in some kind of true and authentic way. And this is coupled with anti-colonialism uh, to where you, to be truly Islamic now is to be anti-colonial or, or to be anti-Western in some sense. So. Showing his favor to us. That's a great question. So just for the sake of the recording, I'll, I'll repeat uh, Dr. Philippin's question in, in short form. Uh, basically, the, Dr. Philippin's asking, when a civilization goes into decline, right, uh, oftentimes does one see the search for uh, a culprit or a scapegoat to blame? And does this help explain 20th and 21st century Islamic antipathy towards the West in some sense, that um, with the decline in the fortunes of Islamic civilization vis-a-vis -vis the West, 
Uh, does this explain antipathy in some sense towards the West? And the answer is, I think, partly yes, but also partly we don't want to discount the fact that uh, there is a great deal of self-criticism in Islam in the 20th century, a great, and, and in the 19th century. If you go back to the, or even the early 19th century, as it's clear that the Ottoman Empire is the sick man of Europe, uh, there's an enormous amount of self-criticism, not just looking for an outside scapegoat in the West, but imagining to oneself, why is God allowing this to happen? Why is God allowing uh, the Christian West or the secular West to dominate us? It must be because we're doing something wrong, and, and some of what we're doing wrong might be traditional Islamic practices like Sufism or the veneration of tombs. And so th there is a kind of um, a, a, a very... Um, strong, I don't want to use the term fundamentalist because I don't want to use that term, but scripturalist and traditionist movement that begins in the early 19th century, which is to, to do a deep soul search and see is, is, is everything that we're doing properly, is it properly Islamic? Uh, or, should we, or are we doing things that are actually bringing down God's wrath upon us? And does that explain why Napoleon conquered Egypt? Uh, you know, are, are we venerating the, the tombs of the companions of the prophet? And maybe, maybe, maybe we're being told that we shouldn't do that, or maybe Sufi mysticism is actually something we should abandon, or something like that. So, so th there's both. There, there's, a, there's blaming the outside, but there's even, if anything, more self-criticism going on in the Islamic world. Uh, and this explains, of course, the, the rise of that thing we call Wahhabism. So, thank you very much.